Well, hello everyone. My name is Pamela Nuri. I'm Head of Expedition Operations at Noble Caledonia and we have with us today on our naturalist chat, Daniel Austin. Now, Daniel is the author of the Brat Guides for Madagascar, probably one of the world's leading experts on Madagascar and its wildlife. I have uh, two of his books right here in my library. He's also the secretary of the anglo Madagascar Society and he's been going there for 20 years, a couple times a year. We're very lucky to have Daniel on many of our Madagascar voyages. And Daniel, I think what I would like to ask you first is, what was it that pulled you over to Madagascar? And then what stuck with you in terms of Madagascar that has made, made you so hooked? Initially, it was an interest in, in flora and fauna, you know, as a kid, as many kids are interested in wildlife, and I would watch uh, a lot of nature documentaries, David Attenborough documentaries, and so Madagascar was something just there in the background, mentioned a little bit more often than other places, and uh, so I, I started reading travel books about Madagascar and sort of getting interested in going to Madagascar. Um, it wasn't until I finished university that I was actually finally able to get to Madagascar. I went there for a, a three-month trip and, and spent some time traveling around. And uh, at that point, it was still very much just the, the, the wildlife focus. Um, but then, um, I mean, it was during that trip, really, that I, I fell in love with all the other aspects of the country. So, you know, the people, how welcoming the people are, the, the, the culture and the language and fascinating things about geology and everything really in Madagascar, not just the, the flora and fauna. Um, and I, to be honest, I think it is the people above everything else that have kept me coming back to Madagascar, you know, rather than just uh, continuing to explore the rest of the world in search of other, other wildlife um, sort of travel and opportunities. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's, um, it, it's still very much a, a wildlife thing for me, but it's the whole package. I mean, it's just a, uh, a, another worldly kind of place. Yeah, um, I, I so enjoyed your answer because someone else I've asked said it was because of the animated penguin movie that got them hooked on Madagascar. <laughs> but also, um, you know, you, I think people have a very singular impression of Madagascar. Maybe they just think, you know, lemurs and baobabs, but it is so much more ecologically diverse, politically, culturally diverse, and as you move around the country, then what people expect is so much more to offer, so much of a bigger island um, than what people actually expect before they go there. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was a, a good tribute to um, all the little hooks that really get you when you, when you go mean, there. It's a huge place. And also the, the fact that, um, you know, it's, it's the world's oldest island um, and fairly isolated from other places. I mean, that's what has made it such a unique place. Um, the fact that it's you know, evolution has been able to go off a totally different tangent from the rest of the world. Um, the wildlife, in many ways, has uh, a more subtle quality than you might find in sort of going, you know, nothing big like elephants and giraffes, but it, it's, it's all very different. When you look closely, um, it's not quite like anything else. And, uh, you know, it's, it's what makes it special. And there's a similar sort of story behind the people of Madagascar, because um, the, originally the Malagasy people came from Asia, and then uh, further waves of immigration from Africa. And so there's this cultural melting pot as well, which um, makes it into you know, a unique place in the world. Yeah, I have to say um, what struck me the first time I went there is the people are beautiful. I mean, they're ex exquisite. Um, and I, I, that really is something I noticed when I first went there. And also, as you go around the country, um, you really can see the different sort of populations and different influences. It's not homogenous at all. No, that, that's absolutely true. And as somebody who, uh, and part of my job is sort of being a photographer, a travel photographer, um, and there are just so many photogenic places. And I mean, it, it's, it's not a race of people that you could ever, you know, say they all look very similar. I mean, just everybody, um, is somewhere on this sort of spectrum between African and Asian and there's so many different physiques and types of face and types of hair um, that you know you just you, you never stop seeing people that you'd like to take their photo and you know the kids are always up for coming and having their photo taken so I mean that's uh, that's something I do quite a bit of when I'm in Madagascar is, is portrait shots. Yeah 
Well, um, we are lucky enough to go on the Island Sky or, or one of our vessels, usually several times a year between sort of November and March. And one of the highlights I know for me is seeing some of those same guides over and over. We always use the same group and you, you know, you turn up in the forest and there's your, your 10 guides that we've been using for years and years. And we have such a wonderful relationship with people in the places we go. Um, it's been a oh, more than 15 year relationship um, with our vessels and Madagascar. And because we go in the off season, they're always usually so happy to have, you know, have the work um, in the sort of rainy season while we're there. And it's a highlight for us as well to see these people, these lovely, lovely guides. That's true. I mean, the, the, the guides are um, some spectacularly knowledgeable guides in Madagascar. Um, and like you say, I mean, they're, they're very grateful to have work in the rainy season. Um, I mean, it, it is a fantastic time to visit Madagascar. It's kind of difficult if you come uh, for a terrestrial trip because uh, the, the rivers come up and some of the roads become difficult to pass. But having the ship just makes everything so easy because, of course, you can get around the outside. Most of the interesting places to see in Madagascar are on the coast or near to the coast. Um, and so really there's no other tourists around, which of course is, is an advantage. Um, it's, it's the middle of their summer, so everything is in full flower. Or the, the, you know, the lemurs have got babies or whatever. Um, so it's a really good time uh, to be in Madagascar um, and particularly, you know, using a ship to get around to overcome all of the, the difficulties with inland travel at that time of the year. Yeah, for sure. I know um, a lot of people read the guidebook and think, why are you going in the rainy season? The guidebook says not to go in the rainy season, but it's different if you're coming from a ship. It's um, a whole lot easier. And as you say, there's a lot of uh, benefits to going in the rainy season. Um, and then what for you would be, I don't know, the places that stick with you the most that you think about the most after you've come back home and you long to go back to you? I mean, there's some very special uh, little islands in, in Madagascar and one of my favorites, if I just show you um, on the map uh, here, which is a map of, uh, there's uh, Madagascar on, on the, towards the left and uh, in, on the right, on the uh, east coast, you can see it's a very straight coast, but there's a bay which, um, which we visit towards the end of the, uh, the cruise in 2022. Um, which is at uh, Anton Gilles Bay in Maswala National Park. And a small island there is, um, is called Nosi Manga Bay, and it's just idyllic. And there's a, oops, I, um, give me a second. I meant to go back and show you a photo of me in Nosi Manga Bay um, years and years ago. This was on my second ever trip to Madagascar. Um, so, yeah, almost 20 years ago. This is the the bay in Nosimanga Bay, the rainforest, the whole island is a, uh, a special reserve. The rainforest comes right down to the beach. Um, there's this gorgeous orange sand and the bay is a place where sometimes you can see turtles or dolphins or whales or whatever. Um, in fact, the whole of Antongil Bay, which contains the island, has been made into a protected uh, shark reserve now. Um, and the island has, has trails as well and it's quite effortless wildlife viewing there. So that I think is probably one of my favorite places in Madagascar because it's, uh, it doesn't have any, any, any buildings or any roads. I mean, there's one hut which is there for, uh, for, for, the, um, for the national park office. Um, and other than that, it's just natural. And there's a few yeah. times I've camped there for several nights and you know, the day tourists come and leave again and you're just there on your own at night. It's a, it's a magical yeah. place. Actually, you know, um, speaking of Maswala Peninsula and that whole area, I think it's unique in the world. And you think a lot of places might have been like that in the past, but in the sense that, you know, we anchor the vessel, you're just a few hundred meters from shore. You feel like you could actually, you know, swim ashore because it's actually quite calm there as well. Um, you walk up onto the beach and literally walk from the beach right into this pristine, primary rainforest and you wake up in the morning it's got that sort of smoky look um, over the forest from all the condensation um, and the noises at night because we anchor there overnight you can hear I always tell the guests to have their 
balconies open because you can hear the lemurs and the ruckus and all the noises of the forest at night. It travels so well over the water and it's, you know, calm and we're quite close in with the bay. So for me as well, we, the two days we spent in, that we spend in the Maswala, Mung Bay area is a, a huge highlight and it's such a privilege to go there. So when I did the scouting for the Island Scout, before we went back after a few years of um, not going during the piracy years, um, I did a big scout. And the difficulty to get to scouting Maswala and seeing the status of things before we sh took the ship back, it took me, you know, days and flights and so much complication to get to Maswala. So it, you really lose appreciation for how remote and inaccessible it is when you just turn up on the ship. But it is absolutely, probably, I would say, one of my favorite highlights of Madagascar as well. That's very true. I mean, you, you touched before on Madagascar being huge. And you know? I mean, it really is huge. I mean, it would be uh, bigger than virtually any country in Europe. Um, I think it's about four times the area of England. And of course, if you, you couple that with the fact that it's a, a very poor country with incredibly basic infrastructure, um, getting around isn't easy. And so if you're, if you're there on a, a, a terrestrial trip, um, a lot of places are incredibly remote, take days and days to get to. Um, and so the beauty of, of having the ship, you know, you, you can get around and see a whole list of places that would take you months quite honestly if you were trying to do it overland yeah yeah and as you say infrastructure is extremely basic it's not like you just pop into the shops and get your meals and it, it's it is very very um basic if you try to do a diy land trip but now i guess i had the sort of forest idea lemurs and forest in my head before i went to madagascar i was so intrigued as you move around the west coast and down to the south, how it changes so considerably. The landscape becomes dry, and every port that you go to, you travel overnight, you go to Newport, it's all new species, all new landscapes, different lemurs, different chameleons, different trees. It's, re it's so big um, and so rapidly changing as you move around. That part of it is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I mean, if, if I show you a, a map of Madagascar, um, which shows the, the vegetation zones. Um, so you can see that there's a whole strip of forest down the east coast. So that's the, the wet side of Madagascar. There's a, a, a kind of spine of mountains that runs from north to south. Um, and so on the east side of that is where you find all the rainforest. Um, but then on the west, you've got most of the west is much drier deciduous forest. Um, and then further down to the south, where you can see um, the, the mostly yellow and, um, and sort of pinky orange patch, um, that's a, a habitat that's absolutely unique to, to Madagascar. That's uh, what's known as spiny forest, um, which looks something like this in areas. These are um, euphorbia trees, and they're incredibly prickly if you get uh, close up to them, um, because there's almost no rainfall in that part of Madagascar. Um, and so you've got this sort of desert forest. Everything uh, is, is, is focused on holding on to its water as, as much as possible. Um, so everything is, is prickly or defensive in some way. Um, and it, it makes this really extraordinary kind of botanical scene. This is also the spiny forest. So you can see a, a baobab tree in the middle um, and octopus trees on either side, um, all of which defending their uh, precious water with long spines. Yeah, this is the side of Madagascar that I think people think of slightly less um, when they usually think of the forest and not the sort of spiny forest side and the de virtual desert down there on the southwest corner. Now, as an experience, I like to explain Madagascar as being, you know, potentially like mosquito head nets, sunblock, you know, good hiking shoes. It's pretty go, 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 pretty intrepid outdoors. Some of the landings with the zodiacs are a little energetic uh, and you're in these long car journeys on potted roads sometimes and then you're getting out and you're meandering through the forest with guides, uh, looking for tiny, huge and small chameleons, craning your neck to see the chameleons. Like it's pretty adventurous trip. It's not, it doesn't always feel exactly like a holiday. Would you agree? Oh, I think that's true. Yes. I mean, there's, there's a, there's, 
really does have quite a, a diversity of things to do. I mean, there's a, a few opportunities for snorkeling, and then, as you say, there's um, rainforest hikes. There's uh, there's trips to the the dry forest, uh, and uh, and then also seeing the, the spiny forest, which are not um, the only three habitats of Madagascar, but um, you know they're, they're the, the key ones. Um, so uh, yeah, I think in all of those places, because we're doing wet landings in the zodiacs, and we're we're really um, you know, doing proper adventuring. Um, yeah, it, it's it's somewhere that is for somebody that appreciates that kind of thing. And I mean, the beauty is, of course, because um, I also sometimes lead small group terrestrial tours as well. But the, the beauty with being on the ship, of course, is you've got your own room with air conditioning and a warm shower at the end of the day. So whatever you've been doing through the day and accumulating mud all over your trousers or whatever it might be you can go and freshen up before dinner and uh, yeah and, and sort of get ready for the next day yeah it's like hard work with incredible rewards um when you come out of it but i'm glad you mentioned the snorkeling because there's a few islands particularly if you do the full circumnavigation types of trips or um you know the almost full circumnavigation trips then uh, there's a couple of islands that are just magic the proper like white sand beach blue water incredible coral reefs wonderful snorkeling um and some of them are uninhabited or some of them are just you know got a few ranges on and those are really really highlights as well interspersed between these sort of jungle forest mud days you know absolutely and you can see on this map which shows in red the uh, the, the route uh, of, of the cruise um, that several places are called Nosi something. So there's Nosi Hau there down bottom left and at the top, Nosi Hara, Nosi Tanikili, and Nosi Manga Bay, which we've already mentioned. Nosi is the Malagasy word for island. And these are all um, pretty impressive places. And especially the three there on the west coast, Nosi Hara, Nosi Tanikili, and Nosi Hau, uh, are all excellent for snorkeling, um, Nosi Tanikili especially. Um, in fact, for, for years, I, I hadn't got to Nusihara um, until only a couple of years ago. Uh, it's absolutely spectacular place. I mean, this was one of my photos from Nusihara. Um, it, it's geologically so unique. And I mean, it's got these gorgeous beaches and blue water. And it's all uh, part of a marine reserve. Um, so I think, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, we're also doing some, we're expecting to do some snorkeling there, which is uh, a real privilege because again, that's one of those places that's just, it, it's uninhabited and it, it takes a lot of organization to get there if you're going there under your own steam. Yeah, um, thanks for showing that uh, particular map. That's of a trip that we've discussed with Daniel, uh, which is the first time we'll be doing that particular voyage. It's the first time we'll be doing a full almost full circumnavigation like that. So I'm quite looking forward to that one in 2022. A lot of the other trips, they just touch over the top of Madagascar, which is um, four or five really nice uh, landing days. But I also spotted in your photos there, um, was that a Fosa? It was, yes. Uh, let me see if I can get it back up. Um, this one. So the, the Fusa is the largest carnivore of Madagascar and the widespread across most of, of Madagascar and they're the biggest predator of the lemurs. Um, everyone thinks it's a, a cat because it's got quite a, especially if you see it in profile, it's quite a puma-like uh, physique with a long tail. Um, but it, it's not actually particularly closely related to cats, it's much more closely related to uh, mongooses and civets. Um, but it's part of a, a unique group to Madagascar, um, uh, w which comprises only about 10 different species. Um, and the, the, the Fusa is extremely difficult to see in almost all parts of Madagascar. I mean, even many guides that you meet around the country have never seen one. Um, but if you go to Kirindi, which is one place that is on the, on the itinerary in the, in the southwest of the country or in the west of the country, um, there are one or two which have kind of become habituated and come to the uh, come towards the the camp area because of sort of being attracted by the, the, the smells from from people's cooking and things. And uh, this is where this photo was taken. People quite often do see the elusive fusa in uh, in Karindi. Yeah, that's absolutely a wonderful photo because I know how elusive and hard to spot they are. 
And the other one, I mean, of course, people, you know, your mind naturally goes to the ringtail lemur and the bigger comedians. But the other one that I just, you know, you'll, you'll always remember is the little dwarf chameleons, um, pardon me, um, the lemurs that sit in, you know, sometimes in those huts, they'll be sitting in a little piece of bamboo and they'll just pop their head up. And they're also quite habituated in some of these camps. Well, one of the, the really unusual things about Madagascar's uh, fauna, which hasn't really been fully explained, um, I mean, it's, it's understood why it's so different, because as I say, it's been evolving separately for such a long time. But nobody quite understands why uh, so many species of each group of animals has, has exploded across the island. So with the lemurs, you've got something like 113 species. Uh, with the chameleons, I think there's 85 or something now, um, which is more than half of all the chameleons in the world. Um, the lemurs are only found in Madagascar, so that's 113 primate species out of only around 500 primates in the whole world. So there's this incredible array of different species. When you, when you talk about a lemur, you're not just talking about one thing. And when you're talking about a chameleon, you know, it could be something like this, or it could be something really like your fingernail. And in fact, uh, Nusihara, the, uh, the island that I was just showing a picture of, um, is the place where you find the, the smallest reptile in the world. That's the, uh, the little Brookesia chameleon, tiny little thing. And the guys are so talented at finding them when you're walking through sort of Amber Mountain and they, this thing is the size of your fingernail and it's on the ground and the guides can spot it. They're so, so talented with that. It, it, yes, I mean, it comes, of course, they, they, they always like to make out they've got amazing vision and of course they do have, are really tuned in, but of course it, it's more than that. It's a, a, an understanding of the forest, understanding of the creatures and, you know, you know, let's say, which tree it feeds on or whatever. And so you can really sort of understand exactly where you yeah. might find it, at what time of day and so on. And uh, because they spend so much time in the forest, um, yeah. you know, we might be walking around looking for them up there, but it's, it's you know, in the heat of the day, they might be down here. Or Yeah. Whatever. And um, that's actually the last thing I, um, I wanted to make sure uh, we mentioned was, you know, it's so important uh, it's natural when you go to these magnificent wilderness areas that you tend to fall in love with them and in a sense become ambassadors for these great countries. But the tourism there and these guys become the eyes of the forest and the tourism there creates a situation where forests are protected where they might otherwise be used for firewood. And a lot of the species are protected because they're valuable, particularly to the guides that are earning an income of it and they become custodians of the forest the guides are so talented they're so enthusiastic and they really are like i said the eyes of the forest the custodians of the forest and us going there is doing a lot for the place and sort of keeping it preserved it's such a privilege to go there but it also comes with this great honor to be an ambassador for those places well that's very true i mean as as, uh, as i think we mentioned already madagascar is literally one of the five or six poorest countries in the world and so of course there are all kinds of pressures on the forest to use the wood and so on for other things you know for survival for for feeding your family um and that of course is is in in uh, sort of contrast against um against the, the protection of the, the species and so there is always that difficulty there and so tourism ecotourism in particular is a huge part of um of, of madagascar's income and it's it's so important because you know if if you didn't have that there would be no incentive to protect the forests and already you know there are, are large parts of the forest in madagascar that are gone and we just it, it would just be such a tragedy if that would happen to the rest of it so um you can't really overstate the importance of uh, of, of ecotourism in madagascar and it, it's it doesn't even take all that much revenue coming into the country to um, to protect a place, because if if charcoal from uh, from the trees just costs a little amount of money, all you need is to make the value of tourism more than that, and it becomes better to protect the forest. Yeah, that's so well explained. Um, well, I think for me, certainly, Madagascar climbed into my heart. Once you go there, I can't see how you would not have it just leave this big 
mark on you. It's an incredible place in terms of the people and the wildlife. So I think you've explained it so wonderfully and I certainly can't wait for our next trip together and that's circumnavigation as well. That's going to be um, the first time we'll do it like that, a couple of new places in that particular trip. So I'm so looking forward to uh, that trip and seeing you again on the next Madagascar trip. Daniel, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> All right. Have a good day. Bye. Yes, you too.